When I was asked to speak about what, what the Austrians say about prediction, uh, I first thought that I would just say that the Austrians say you can't do it and then conclu- just sit down. But uh, I predicted that that wouldn't have altogether good consequences for me if I did that. And in any case, it wouldn't be altogether true. The Austrians don't say there's absolutely nothing at all you can say about the future, nothing that you can predict. However, there are, in the Austrian view, severe limitations to what one can predict about the economy or what one can say about the future. And I want to uh, go into some of the reasons for this. Now, the uh, Austrian method of economics, and this uh, made most clear by Mises in his great book of 1949, Human Action, is a deductive method, or praxeolog- what he calls a praxeological method. He talks about the science of praxeology. Uh, I find people who read Human Action always find the section, or practically always find the section which Mises discusses these issues, the part about praxeology, which is about the first uh, 140 or so pages of the book, the most difficult part of the book, and they uh, they they always assign this when the, we have the Mises University. They always assign this part to me to lecture about. I think they're they're trying to tell me something, but I'm not going to try to figure out what it is. Uh, but so what does Mises in the praxis, in the Human Action says? What is it that the economist is doing? Well, according to Mises. The economist is starting from the axiom that human beings act. The economist is considering what is the nature of action. What can we tell about what any action is, no matter what kind of action it is, just by thinking about the concept of action. We imagine any particular action you want, say my lecturing or you're listening to me, anything you like. We say, what is involved in the structure of the action, just in the action as such. What does any action have? And if you, those of you who are familiar with the way Mises develops the notion, will remember that he gets a whole lot of things about action just from the concept, like any action involves the use of means to achieve ends, and in each action a person is trying to achieve his most highly value goal. So what he's doing is to elaborate deductively various consequences of the notion of action. Now, when he's doing this, as you remember, I just said he's considering the form of any action, whatever it is. He's not considering particular action. So he's not considering, say, what, uh, how much, say, someone demands oranges, what the person's demand for oranges or apples is, or what, how much someone values money. He's considering what is involved in any action at all, and he won't be coming up with any laws about, in economics, about specific quantities that people want. He won't be having any laws such as that uh, if you increase the supply of money by 3%, prices will go up by such and such an amount. There won't, he said, there won't be, uh, just from the notion of action, we won't be able to come up with any relationships of that kind because we're just considering, as I say, just the structure of action. We won't be coming up with quantitative estimates. Now, you might say, well, this doesn't show that you can't come up with such estimates, all that shows is that uh, you can't come up with them by praxeology. You can't come up with them by the deductive process of reasoning that Mises has uh, uh, elaborated and carried out in his own economics. But Mises, as you know, those of you who read him know, always has anticipates objection, has an answer for them. He says, not only is it the case that the deductive method won't come up with quantitative laws of economics. He doesn't think there's any other way of doing it either. He says in economics, in matters dealing with human action, unlike the physical sciences, there are just too many variables 
uh, involved for us to be able to come up with quantitative laws. These, these quantitative laws would be ones obviously not deductive consequences of action, but just uh, empirical laws, say, the kind we had in physics. He said we can't come up with them because there are too many variables and we can't do controlled experiments as we can in the physical sciences. So he said, we really, you can't get quantitative uh, predictions in economics. You can't say, have any uh, such predictions either by praxeology or any other method. Now, so as if this weren't bad enough for the notion of prediction, there's another element that uh, must be considered in in bearing on this topic. And I say, as Mises developed the notion of the economy, various uh, matters, economic matters such as inflation or the business cycle, he always, uh, Austrian economists do, has always started from, built up the total thing uh, he was con- top he was concerned with from individuals' actions. He was concerned say, let's take an example of this. Suppose we have uh, the government increases the supply of money. What will be the effect on prices? Well, we've already said that we can't give quantitative estimates, but what, we, what can we say about uh, the increase of uh, uh, supply of money on prices? Well, as, as the Austrian Mises analyzes, what we don't do is say uh, we consider, try to consider the economy as a whole. We, we don't try to come up with some relationship, say the, the supply of money has gone up by a certain amount, therefore prices, all prices will rise by this, a certain amount. Uh, Irving Fisher had a famous, uh, called the equation of exchange, which is, his uh, follower, in the, at least in this respect, Milton Friedman, has the notion that just by plugging in the amount of increase into this equation of exchange, you can come up with an amount that prices will rise as a whole. Uh, Fisher and Friedman and their followers would admit that not all prices rise exactly the same amount, but they think just from inc- uh, some information about how the supply of money is increasing the economy, we can come up with some general statement of, from this equation of exchange of how prices rise. Now, the Misesian, the Austrian way is different. What we would say is that supposing, uh, m- supposing money is injected into the economy, well, the people who get this money first will find they have a lot of money that they didn't have before to spend on on various things. So they'll have an increase in their income. And then the things they, they'll they find, first, since they're the ones who have the money, we have by hypothesis, the other people haven't gotten money yet, price, they find the prices won't rise for them. They'll, they will rise to a certain extent on goods they spend their money on, but they'll be doing very well because the prices won't yet have risen while they're spending the money. Now the people who get the money from them will also be in a fairly good position because they'll get have more money and they'll be able to spend it on various goods, the prices of which haven't risen yet. But as the money spreads more and more, people who have the money, the new money will find that most goods have risen in price already, so as the people later on in the uh, chain of circulation, as money is going on, will find that for them, the prices have risen, the goods they want to buy, so they won't be benefiting very much, if at all, from any increase in money. So you see the basic difference between the Misesian way of analyzing an increase in supply of money and this method that I've mentioned, say, that uh, Irving Fisher and Milton Friedman have. The, the austrian Misesian way is considering what the effects are on particular people. So you see, you can see how this makes prediction much more difficult and also makes more difficult uh, trying to use Austrian 
theory in, uh, say, particular uh, finance, to try to uh, use it in particular financial decisions. Uh, supposing somebody were to say, well, I, pre- I think it's very likely the government is going to continue inflating the money, so what I'm going to do is borrow some money and then I'll make a lot of money because I'll be able to invest it and make some money in my business and then when I pay back the loan, if I'm right that inflation has gone up more uh, by what I predicted and say I predicted more, it would rise by more than other people would, I'll be able to pay it back in money of less value so I'll make a, I'll make a big profit on the deal. Now, on the Austrian way, this would be much more difficult to, 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 uh, to carry off because whether the person made the profit would depend on where he is in the uh, chain of circulation. Is, the money, is he someone who's gotten the money right away or in one of the first to get the new injections of money that he might do very well, but if he's later on, if he gets it only one of the later people to get it, then he won't... Uh, get, he won't benefit as much, he won't be able to do this sort of calculation of the kind I've uh, uh, I've just imagined. Now, let's take uh, another example of how the Austrian stress on individual action is limits predictability. Now, uh, several of the other speakers have mentioned the Austrian theory of business cycle in which Say so the, the government increases the supply of bank credit, which drives the money rate of interest below the natural rate of interest, and this induces uh, people to invest in higher stages of production than they otherwise would have. And when it, it, the expansion stops, then it uh, comes about that these investments are and people return to the uh, their the, nat- the natural rate of interest based on their rate of time preference. It'll turn out that these investments in the higher stages were unproductive. That there's been overinvestment. These will have to be liquidated. Now, some economists have objected to this account. They say, well, what happens when people find out about the Austrian business cycle theory? Then They'll just, when the government increases the money supply, they just won't invest. So the people will be able to anticipate that these investments, these investments won't work out. So the the Austrian business cycle theory won't operate at all. People just anticipate what the government is going to do. So you say, so the argument there is that people can, by knowing about the effects of the government measures, they can anticipate, they can predict what's going to happen, and then they won't, they won't uh, follow the overexpansion. We can make this more general, the rational expectations theory of uh, Robert Lucas at the University of Chicago and his followers tends to say that uh, government monetary policy that's designed to change the economy is always ineffective because uh, people will be able to anticipate the consequences of it. So you see, now from the Austrian point of view, the problem with this way of looking at things is that it's assuming that people can, uh, it's taking people as acting together in a way, it's as if everybody acted in the same way, everyone is successful in anticipating the government's action. And it doesn't consider that from how that certain individuals might react in this way and then uh, if they not invest, others would. What the Austrian view is that one can't take sort of an aggregate of all investors or all businessmen and say everyone will react in this way so everyone will rationally anticipate what the government's going to do and by doing so cancel the effect and we just have to in the Austrian view just take effects of individuals just and say well certain individuals will re- will act in one way others will do it in a different way and one can't predict that all individuals will react in a certain way to the same government policy. Uh, Mises I should say was well aware of the uh, uh, 
uh, the effect that people can react in a way to counter government policy. And in fact, he was one of the first to point out that government inflationary policy can be fail to achieve the ends that the uh, government wants by it because of people's anticipations. But he, he rejected any kind of rigid or mechanical uh, view in which everyone at the same time responds in a, the same way to the government policy. Uh, now, uh, I should say, uh, if Mises did consider the case where uh, just people wouldn't altogether respond to government increase in uh, the money supply. And he said, well, in that case, there wouldn't be a business cycle. This is just not a problem for his theory. He's trying to explain the business cycles that do happen, not the ones that don't. And he had a very good article on this in uh, the British journal Economica, which came called Elastic Expectations in the Business Cycle. This came out in, uh, I think, 1943. Now, let me give you one last illustration of how the Austrian uh, view of uh, individual that one has to, in economics, one has to deal only with individuals in their action. One isn't dealing in aggregates or how everyone reacts at the same time is crucial. Uh, as many of you know, there's a Mises developed a criticism of government intervention into the economy of this kind. He said, well, let's suppose the government imposes some measure such as price control. It'll say the government thinks there's people aren't getting certain goods like they're not. He gives the example he gives uh, one of his essays. They're not people. He wants people should poor people should be able to get milk at low cost. So the government imposes price control, maximum prices on milk. So he says, well, the result will be we will have a shortage of milk. The, the policy will fail from the point of view of the people who wanted it. So then he said, well, what will happen then? Either we, the government will have to repeal the price control or have further price controls designed to uh, make the... Uh, to try to remedy the first situation, then the same thing will happen again. Those will fail and the government will be faced with either going on further or going back and to the free market. Now, there's an objection that uh, I think Paul Samuelson has put uh, to a similar argument by Hayek, and he said, well, look, uh, this isn't what happened. According to this argument, we should be either have... Uh, a complete free market or a total regulated system. We don't have that. We have some kind of intermediate state. It means it seems to be arguing that uh, the measures will fail their effect and they'll have to push on either to full regulation or abolish regulation. We don't have that. We have some kind of intermediate system. But you see, to this objection is completely to misunderstand the Austrian argument. It isn't saying that the uh, government will react in this kind of mechanical way that either having to push forward or go back. it will just say that these are the decisions, that in, this is the structure of a situation that will confront the government either to have to, if, he, if, he's, if the government, uh, governmental powers are unsatisfied with the situation, they'll either have to try to remedy it by having more controls or move back. It isn't saying that people will react in this mechanical way. It, that depends on the particular people involved, and it's altogether conceivable that people, the government will just decide to flounder around indefinitely in this, uh, in this kind of condition of partial regulation. So you see, the objection there to the possessing view is one that totally ignores the individualistic basis of the whole theory. So, see, I think in, those, in these three ways I've tried the, uh, the, with the uh, fact of inflation, the business cycle, and uh, the intervention argument, I've tried to show how the Austrian view of uh, that economics is based on consideration of individual action limits what very much what we can uh, say about prediction as opposed to uh, views of economics that view matter more, that view the economy as a whole or in aggregates. 
Now, I'll just say in conclusion, we have to avoid moving to the opposite extreme and saying that we can't know anything at all about the future. Well, we can obviously know some things if Austrian economics is right, such as the way the laws discuss, that the laws discovered by Austrian economics hold in the future. The other view, the, the so radical uncertainty of the future, was adopted by uh, Ludwig Lachmann, who, uh, this was, uh, who said, well, we just don't know anything at all about the future, but it's not clear why he held this. It seemed to be part of some kind of general philosophical view of his, but I've never been able to figure out what the arguments are for it are supposed to be. The view was also held uh, by uh, G.L.S. Shackle. I remember in the, when, when I, one time when I was talking to Lachman, he said to me, oh, the, the great book on economics, the, really the masterpiece, is uh, Shackle's book, Epistemics and Economics. So I went and had a look at that, and I turned to the first page, and I see it's dedicated to Lachman. Uh, so I guess uh, one can see why Lachman recommended it. But I, uh, so, but you see this view that sort of says we don't know anything about the future at all. If that were we take that seriously, that would end economic theory altogether. So the Austrian view that because we're limited to the actions of individuals, we have we our ability to predict is very limited, has to be very sharply distinguished from the infinite emptiness of the view held by Professor Lachmann.